Today's sermon is God always answers his children. God always answers his children. One of the more famous accounts in the Old Testament about prayer is the famous early kingship prayer of Solomon, the son of King David, the man after God's own heart, that's David. His son Solomon had ascended to the throne in David's last days. But Solomon's heart, as we can see in the early chapters of 1 King, early on, was already divided between loyalty to God and loyalty to the pleasures of the flesh, between faithfulness and righteousness with God and the world. Solomon was really the man perpetually pulled two different directions. He had a divided heart. But in one of his high moments, uh, when the Lord God actually, and Solomon wasn't even supposed to be here, so this shows you God's grace, he's at a high place making an offering to the Lord. He's not supposed to make offerings at high places. Nobody under the law is supposed to do that in the Old Testament, and the king's definitely not supposed to. But he's making an offering at a high place, and uh, the Lord appears and speaks to Solomon. And he invites Solomon to ask basically whatever Solomon's heart desires which is when you love to have that experience, God comes and says, look, I see you, I love you, I'll give you whatever you ask for. Well, that's, that's the time we get this in the Old Testament. This happens. And uh, if, if, if you've been around the Bible or Sunday school much, you're probably going to know in general that Solomon asked for wisdom. Um, and then God says, I'm so pleased with this, I'm going to give you everything else. Specifically, though, Solomon actually, when you read the Scripture said this. This is 1 Kings 3, 9. So give your servant an understanding or actually literally hearing, in other words, let me hear you and let me hear your word always, hearing heart. Lev Shema'ah. A Shema'ah means to hear. Hear, O Israel. The Lord, that's why we call the Shema, Deuteronomy 6 following. Hear, O Israel. It's called the Shema. So he says, let me have a hearing heart where I hear you. When I'm making my decisions, when I move through life, let me hear you and your word always. That's actually what he says. And that then is going to guide him in discernment and wisdom. Okay? So he, actually, scripturally, you, you want to know that. So he says, give, give your servant a hearing or an understanding heart so that I can judge your people to discern between good and evil. To discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Solomon's life, though, unfortunately, goes on to illustrate. You know, as he commits adultery right and left, has all kinds of marriages, moves in all kinds of different directions away from the Lord. His life reminds us of the need to persevere in prayer and our seeking after the Lord. To keep our hearts hearing God and God's word. Because for so many people, including Solomon, it's really easy to get involved in all our pleasures and all our activities and all our events and all our parties and all this, this, that, and the other stuff and all our uh, love liaisons and this, that, and the other thing. And you know what? There's not any room or time for God and definitely for hearing God's word. So his life reminds us of that. And it's interesting, when we get to the New Testament, James, the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, in the letter of James, hyperconnects us not only to the Solomon story and our need for discernment and wisdom, but also to Jesus' calling that we should ask and seek, and it will be given to us. So listen to this. This is James 1, 5, and 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, okay, we're supposed to be remembering, okay, Jesus is the infinitely greater son of David, and his Solomon, his son Solomon, his child, ask, but actually ends up failing on what he's been given, okay? We, as children belonging to the household of the greater son of David, who, of course, infinitely exceeds David, Jesus, we're supposed to ask and actually live in wisdom hearing the word of God. So, I think James is saying all that when he says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who generously gives to all without reproach, and it will be given him. 
But let him, let the person, let the Christian ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And James, again, is picking up on what Jesus our Lord says. So if you who are evil know good gifts to give to your children, how much more the Father who is in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those asking him. We have this promise. God's word is sure. God always answers his children. Here's our primary scripture. We've been reflecting on these verses in different ways over the last number of Sundays. So let's go to these again. Uh, Luke 11, 1 through 4, leading into Luke's presentation of Jesus' teaching on the way to pray, otherwise called like the disciples' prayer, the Lord's prayer. And then finally, verses 9 through 13. Now it came to pass, he, Jesus, was in a certain place praying. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, these are Jews who know how to pray, but they want the way of Jesus. Teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. And he, Jesus, said to them, when you, all these yous are plural here in this, 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 this sequence right here. When you, when y'all pray, and here's a plural imperative, you all should together say, Father, May your name be honored as holy. May your kingdom come. And then our personal supplications. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And then Luke 11, 9 through 13. And to you, I say, and here in this verse, again, we're plural. We're going to go to singular, but here we're plural. And to you, I say, Jesus says, ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone asking receives, and to the one seeking finds, and to the one knocking it shall be opened. Now, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. So if you, you, who are evil, know good gifts to give your children, how much more the Father who is in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those asking him? God always answers his children. Now, you can come to questions of faith if you want to and ask these questions or email these to me. Uh, if you're going to say, but I prayed in Jesus' name for the Mercedes Benz or for the bonus or to get in that school that I really needed to get into or that she would marry me instead of her. Uh, sorry, we probably need to do some pastoral counseling on the last one. But, you know, God didn't do it. God didn't answer my prayers. In other words, you're saying that you, God didn't let you push him around and treat him like your slave to do whatever your fleshly heart wanted at the given time. That's not what I'm talking about with prayer. I'm talking about the way Jesus teaches us to pray. And he's just taught us how to pray. We've spent the last three months looking at that. God always answers his children and his children. Yes, I know we struggle. You and I struggle. I, I struggle sometimes. I sometimes pray for the wrong things. But God redirects us by this Holy Spirit. When we don't know how to pray, the Spirit intercedes for us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because as I sometimes say the wrong thing, if I'm going to be a child of God, my prayers are going to move in the direction of what we just read, seeking the kingdom and ultimately receiving not only Christ, but in Christ also the kingdom and, yes, the Holy Spirit in us. So today we're going to talk about the shepherd, our supplication, and God's spirit. The shepherd, our supplication, and God's spirit. First of all, the shepherd's saving love poured out for us. You're going to see this verb over and over again, poured. Okay. The shepherd's saving love poured out for us. That's Jesus. Our supplication poured out to our loving Father. Are you pouring out your supplication to the Father? He loves you. He's inviting you. How much time, how much heart are you in prayer? And then third, God's spirit that he gives us, whom he gives us, through whom he pours his love, he pours his love into our hearts. Okay, so first of all, the shepherd. 
Last week, I preached on when children are in danger, no one's neutral. When children are in danger, no one's neutral. And although the national and international folks who sometimes hit our sermons and such on podcast and on YouTube are a whole lot more excited about the previous sermon, Jesus says game on. For whatever reason, that one's just kind of picking up a lot of hits internationally. But last week, I liked the sermon last week because I was talking about grace at the beginning. My older daughter, when she was about three years old, and I left you with a cliffhanger, though. I was kind of bad to you. I said the first part of the story, and I didn't give you the second part. So everybody's asking me, what happened with grace? All right, so here it is. Uh, you'll remember where I left you hanging last week. You know, we've lost her outside Barney's playground, outside the studio, Universal Studios. Go back and listen to last week's sermon if you missed it. Them saying, uh, in response to Nancy's, like, in, in, you know, deploy the lost child protocol immediately, and they're like, we don't have one. You're on your own, kid. If you're not with me searching for my kid, you're against me. Sorry, you know. So that's where we were. So we prayed. I remember Nancy and I praying because we were, I mean, our hearts were, I, my heart wasn't beating very much. We prayed and we searched. And Martin went out and kind of did the Martin thing, you know, talking to a lot of people and getting out in the walkway outside the play area, trying to, you know, describing Grace's outfit, her little jumpsuit or whatever she was in, and this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we pray, somebody else gets the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Did y'all know that? It's not always about you. So I'm praying, and I'm pretty desperate, and God, dads, you got to remember this, sometimes God's going to speak through mom, right, or to mom. So... Nancy was led to cross over this walkway into this stroller park area. And Grace, you know, she's really little, but Nancy saw the little top of Grace's head amid all these strollers that were parked across the way in connection with two or three of these major areas. So that's what Grace was fascinated by the strollers. Hey, you can relate to that, right? A three-year-old or one who's about to turn three. She thinks the strollers are great. How fascinating. Um, so that's what happened. But this story then, coming back this week, reminds us of divides. That was a divide for us, a divide of shock, separation from our child, and wondering where our child was and where our child would end up, okay? Let me ask you this, if you're a parent, where, were, where, where will your child be found? What's your child's destination? What is your destination for that matter? You know, according to Jesus and according to the Bible, the way we walk in this life, the direction we take, has to do with our eternal destination. Jesus says there's a whole lot of people in his day and nowadays. I mean, they can be supposedly religious people, good people, people we went to school with, this, that, and the other thing. But he says most people are on a broad way to go through a big old gate that leads to destruction. And Jesus says, but there are a few people who go the narrow way, the hard way. And they're going through a different kind of gate. It's ultimately Jesus who says, I am the gate. And they're going into a way of life, a new life, an eternal life. Parents, which way are you going and which way are you guiding your children in your choices each day, each week? And you can say, oh, I know how to say all the right things. I'm asking which way. Are you going? Because Jesus says, look, there are a lot of people who are going to say to me, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, I never knew you. Like, you never came with me. You didn't come with me. What's your destination? What's your child's destination? And by the way, if they're going to be in heaven, will you be there with them? So here's my main point today on this issue. At least end up somewhere on purpose. Go ahead and be upfront about it end up somewhere on purpose because you know what you're going to end up somewhere so at least do it on purpose if you're going to go with jesus i mean go all in with jesus 
but don't talk the talk and not walk the walk. End up where you're going and direct your children where you want them to go on purpose. What you do in scheduling for your children and what you do in reflecting who you are guides them. Train up a child in the way he should go when he's old, he will not depart from it. That goes both ways, that's a double-edged sword. You train him up the wrong way, you train him up the right way. I'm saying all this in part because we're in a baptism Sunday. This reminds us of this even as we talk about prayer. Christian parents know this, it's not really about you. Your children are not about you. They're not there to give you vicarious fulfillment of your own passions and dreams. They are entrusted to you in the most incredible gift I think that God can give us in the flesh to guide them unto a spiritual union with Christ. Teach them that it's neither about you nor the world, but it's about God. What do we want to do as parents? We want to lead and grow up our children from depending on us and trusting in us. Oh, we're just going to have family time together. It's all about us. No, no, no. That's not what you want. You want a strong family, yes. But you want something that goes far beyond that. We want to lead them from depending on and trusting in us, or for that matter, certainly in the world and their friends out there, to depending on and trusting in the Lord. And that's what a real prayer of God's real children is all about. And that sometimes means choosing. Now, you know I love sports. You know, well, I'm not really into shopping, but it's okay. And uh, social media, I'm not, I'm not freaking out about social media, but sometimes we need to move away from an overabundance of sports, shopping, and social media to seek the Savior, because Jesus says, seek me, okay? Pray his way for not digital accessibility, but divine access. Parent, Manifest the life of Christ and the life of the Spirit in your own life with your child and in your true heart. And they can sniff it out if you're real or not. I mean, they see the decisions we make with them, but also with us, with ourselves. So the shepherd guides us in this, the shepherd. We talked about devil's defeat and undivided love on July 28th. Like I said, for whatever reason, August 4th seems to really have struck a nerve. Jesus says, game on. But last week, when children are in danger, no one's neutral, and we heard that from Jesus. Jesus says, Luke eleven twenty three, whoever is not with me, and this includes parents, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather, this includes parents, whoever does not gather with me scatters. This is in the context of Jesus' parable about what he's doing in his coming. First John 3, 8 tells us, he came to destroy the works of the devil. The Son of God appeared to destroy the works of the devil, 1 John 3, 8, part B. Well, here's his parable about it. Jesus says, when a strong man, this means the devil, fully armed, guards his own palace, in other words, the devil has control over the world, Jesus tells us that, Paul tells us that, his goods are safe, but when one stronger than he attacks him, this is Jesus and his coming, when one stronger than the devil attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. We've looked at this, we looked at this last week, how this fulfills the second servant song of Isaiah, Isaiah 49, and all those scriptures we looked at last week. And so Jesus then says, whoever is not with me in this is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. But we said last week, and let me remind you again today, and it's really for us as a church family in equipping our children and definitely directly for parents, Verse 23 of Luke 11 is shocking because Jesus is talking about gathering. He's not talking about cutting people's heads off. That turns out to be key to the gospel. Our way is not the way of the sword. The way he brings down Satan is to give himself, to give his life away in gathering children. Gathering. Um, Synago, I talked about this last week, the Greek there in the New Testament that, that, that we get in Luke, is used, you know, not for attack, but for farming fishing, shepherding, and parenting. So we talked last week about the crisis, first of all. Secondly, Christ, his cross and calling. And third, 
our choice or our choices. Well, how does he do it? How does he gather? Because we want to go with him. Remember Isaiah 40, 11. Like a shepherd, he will, this is the prophecy of God's coming, fulfilled in Jesus. Like a shepherd, he will pasture his flock. In his arms, he will gather, kavats, the lambs, and carry them in his bosom. Those with young children, he shall gently lead. Well, how's he going to do it? Is he going to kill a bunch of people? No, he's going to die for them. John 10, 14 through 16, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not from this fold. It's a great commission from all the nations. I, I must bring them in. I must gather them also. Here is the heart of the gospel. The shepherd's saving love poured out for us. Do you understand? He's poured out his life in love for you. God's gift of Christ is justifying death and his mission for us in the gospel. These are our calling. Poured out. Jesus specifically uses this terminology at the Last Supper to tell us what he's doing, and we remember this in communion. For instance, he says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out. I'm pouring out my blood. I'm pouring out my life in love for you to save you children. Believe me. Give yourself to me. That's Jesus. And then, for us as Christians, and for us as parents, Christian parents, this really struck me this week in preparing for this. So, look, understand, yes, Christ's death is once for all. It is our justification alone. Nothing else, else but Christ. But we are called ourselves to deny ourselves and to take up our cross and follow him. And we pour ourselves out as Christians and definitely as Christian parents. So look at this in Paul. The Apostle Paul says, this is in Philippians 2, 17 and 18. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Now, isn't that, that is a verse, I actually, it hit me this week, this past week, every Christian parent should learn that verse, because that's what we're called to do as Christian parents. To pour out ourselves and our life as a drink offering in the hope and in the joy that our children would know the Lord. Do you hear what I'm saying? Sometimes you feel like you're being poured out. Well, pour yourself out in the direction of Christ, not in the direction of the world. Parents poured out. So that's the shepherd and our following him. Next, our supplication poured out to our loving Father. We've been talking about this. And I want to really focus you on this. Understand all this conversation that Jesus is giving us centers on prayer, God's gift of prayer, calling us to love, trust, and seek him. Unanswered prayer? No. God always answers his children's prayers in Jesus' way. Father, may your name be honored as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we ourselves have forgiven those who are indebted to us and lead us not in temptation. For everyone asking receives, the one seeking finds, to the one knocking it shall be opened. You understand this begs the question, what, what's opened? When we ask, what do we get? And it's God. Okay, so first of all, we get God in his kingdom, which is realized in Christ. And I want to take you to this first part of Romans 5, 1 through the beginning of uh, verse 5, and then I'm going to ask a question. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we get in seeking. This is what the gospel gives us. Through him, through Jesus, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We stand. We will stand at the judgment. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Oops, there's the Jesus part. We're going to suffer for our faith. We're going to suffer in our faith. We're going to suffer as Christian parents, right? We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering has a point to it produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. Why? How can you possibly say that? Because everyone who asks receives. What? The kingdom? Yes. Christ? Yes. And what else? 
It's exactly where Jesus is taking us in Luke 11, 13. Paul says it here in Romans 5, 5. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. There's that pour again. Through the Holy Spirit who has been given us. God's own love, God's self and the fullness of his love is poured into every born and new Christian through the Holy Spirit. And it's a gift. We don't work on it, it's a gift. God's spirit he gives us through whom he pours his love into our hearts. God's supreme gift to us, securing our salvation. This is the way we're united with Jesus. This is the way Veda can be united and saved, through the Holy Spirit filling her and uniting her with Jesus and empowering her and empowering us for his kingdom. I love the way the Puritan writer Thomas Goodwin says, the Holy Spirit is with us in our pain. Did you know that? That's what the scripture tells us. Even when we suffer, we're not alone because the Lord by his spirit fills us with his love and assures us that he's with us. That's what faith means. Uh, that was at our opening hymn too. Max Lucado tells a story about when his, one of his daughters was really young. She was a toddler. He took her to a park and he decided to go buy ice cream for her. But when he came back, she had all this dirty sand in her mouth because she was eating sand. Ever had that experience with a young child? And he wanted to give her ice cream, this incredible treat, but her mouth was full of dirt and sand. So what did Max Lucado, as a pretty good father, do? Did he spank her and ridicule her and reject her and not give her the ice cream? No, by water he washed out her mouth and he gave her the goodness of what he wanted to give her. So also the scripture assures us that even when we stumble and fall, the Lord calls us back as the loving father to invite us to receive what he gives us, his own self, his own spirit. God's spirit he gives us through whom he pours his love into our hearts. And we need that love, yes? May we rejoice in that love. And that love and that spirit bring us wisdom. So back to Solomon at the beginning. What is our wisdom like? What is the Holy Spirit like at work in us? Well, I looked at Isaiah a lot last week. Let me take you to this one. This prophecy of Jesus, Isaiah 11, 1 and 2. Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse. Jesse is the father of David. This is telling you this is going to be a greater David because it's not from David, it's from Jesse. Okay, so this, whoever this son in the line is infinitely exceeds David. Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is the seven spirits. If you're in my revelation study, you know this, right? Here's the seven. The spirit of the Lord, number one, shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. When God pours out his love through the Holy Spirit in us, we receive all of this. He doesn't hold anything back. And he gives us what we need to make choices and to walk his way, and parents to make choices and go with Christ, and Veda and all our children to choose Jesus, to have truly a heart that hears the Lord and hears his word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.